Um, this seminar, it's kind of important that you already know a bit about Vim. <laughs> kind of important. So if you have never had any ex experience with Vim, you might be a little lost. <laughs> And we can't really help. Does anyone fall in that category? Okay, cool. So you're all, you've all done Vim Tutor, you know HJKL, you know that sort of stuff, right? Right. Okay, cool. You're good people. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Have a seat. Now, to get started, I'm Austin. I'm the president of Comes to ACM. This is Robert, the vice president. And like I said, we're talking about Vim, the best editor around. It's not Emacs, it's not Nano or Pico. It's not Sublime Text or TextMate, it's Vim. That's right. Some people say it's Emacs and Google Mode, but we think they're wrong. Well, you see, the way you got to think about it is Emacs has an evil mode to emulate VI behavior, so it's conceded victory to Vim implicitly. No, it's not. Because evil mode comes close, but it's not there. Okay. This is just a really terrible operating system. Terrible error. It's a decent operating system with a good text editor. All right. So. <laughs> This seminar is not so much a uh, learn how to do, but uh, here's a bunch of cool stuff you can do. We're going to go through a lot of material, and if we want to keep it quick, we're going to have to move through it kind of slow. But we are going to have some, uh, wait. I just, right, quickly. We're going to have to move through it kind of quickly, not slowly. Robert is actually going to do some um, stunt. stunt vimming over on <laughs> the projector while we talk about what we're doing. So. Um, we actually have a lot, of, a lot of content to go through. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, also, feel free to follow along on your own computer because it has been. Why not? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> yeah, it's almost the newest. Kind of far away. Kind of five years off. Yeah. Five years. Never mind. That's pretty close. Kind of like LaTeX. It's kind of five years off. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, so without further ado, Robert, what's coming up? So. We're going to start out with setting some expectations for this discussion. I know Austin's already kind of hit on that a little bit. And then we're going to be talking about what is Vim and what are all these great features that we've been talking about. Then we get into those great features. Yes. So let's set expectations. Austin's already said that we're not going to cover what Vim Tutor covers you. Um, this is designed to be an intermediate to advanced level seminar. Um, this is not going to make you a Vim guru. Um, that comes with a lot of practice. Because some of this is neat tricks and stuff, but you actually need to commit these things to muscle memory before they actually start being really useful. We're only going to show you less than 10% of Vim's capabilities. You made that number up. <laughs> give or take. Um, so this quote on the bottom of the screen you'll see, it's kind of small actually, um, is actually from the Vim guru that I learned from. And it says, most people use only about 10% of the functionality of Vim. That 10% of functionality varies from person to person. And that's very much true. We're going to be covering some stuff today that's very useful for programming and general text editing, but generally kind of useful stuff. Some things this discussion will do is show you some of what we think are the coolest features of Vim and give you some tools to help teach yourself how to learn more. So what is Vim? It's a programmer's text editor. That means it's going to provide features that help you program code faster and easier and help debug that code. It's good for writing anything now. Yeah, I use it to write letters once a month. Also, it's an incredibly valuable tool to master. I've ran across, just in my job, five or six things a day that I probably save myself 10 or 15 minutes by doing a quick Vim script or a quick macro. It's very, very powerful. Um, but that said, Vim is not all of your tools in your toolbox. There are some things that Vim does not do very well. And if you want to learn more about some of those other tools that you should have in your toolbox, you should come back in two weeks when we cover various different Unix and Linux tools. So one of the biggest and most important things to understand about Vim from the get-go is this concept of composability. So, Every command that you do in Vim is split up into two parts, what we're going to call an action and what we're going to call a motion. Well, most commands, not all of them. Yeah, but there's several commands that are split up in this way. So actions do something, like delete, a delete or put, or change. These are actions that we think about. But there's also what are called motions. 
Motions are ways to move the cursor. We're going to be talking a little bit more about motions in a second, and we'll demonstrate it at that point. But it's important to realize that in Vim, commands that you do are a combination of both. So for example, you can delete a line as well as delete a paragraph. The delete key is used in both of them, and the motion for a line is used for the line version, and the motion for a paragraph is used in the paragraph version. So by learning just a small set of actions and a small set of commands, they come together to re represent a much larger scope of functionality. So understanding this concept, I would say, is fundamental to moving forward and understanding them. So, and this is Austin's quote here, most editors don't have anything like this. It's really kind of a different concept. Sublime Text tries to emulate it with vintage mode that kind of gets lame after a little while. So let's talk about some of the motions that you can do. Now, not all of these are the ones that can be combined with the, oh, thanks, Robert. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. So, um, what's your, uh, is that your line or what, a higher line, what is your line set up? Uh, we'll cover that in VimRC in just a minute. Okay. okay, well, I have the presentation right here, so I don't have to complain to Robert every time he changes to the Vim thing. So, one of the first, oh boy, that's ugly. Yeah, some lorem ipsum there for you. That's hideous. Okay. So one of the first things that I wanted to point out is one of my favorite commands. It's not actually something you can really inject into your deleting stuff and changing and moving around, but it's going to the last point where you change something, which is G semicolon. And you go back with G colon, I mean G comma. So if Robert edits anything, and then go, oh god, that's ugly. <laughs> Everything is misspelled. All right, Robert, show us, can you? Yes. If you change something and then um, want to go back to where that was, then you can just use G semicolon. <laughs> now, that's not quite as applicable, maybe, as the text objects. Um, these are really super useful. You can combine um, an object with an A or an I. It's much better to actually just demonstrate it to try to explain. But as an action, well, as a motion, you can use, for example, AW to say, I want to do something to a word. Um, let's see it. I'm uh, using V to. Oh, we, they don't know about V yet. Okay. Just delete a word. Some, um, some text objects are a word, a sentence with S, a paragraph, a block, or a different kind of block. Um, these things are pretty useful, primarily, primarily because if you're sitting in the middle of a word and you type D-A-W, then you can delete that entire word without having to go to the end of the front part. You can also change, so if you want to replace a word, you do C-I-W. Um, the difference between A and I is an, like a, the whole thing or the inner part of it. So an example is if you want to delete an entire quote area, you can type DA uh, quotes, that'll delete the whole thing. If you want to change what's inside of it, you can go with CI quotes. Um, Robert's like, yeah, he's calling the line. They're pretty useful. Um, they're, I think they're in help, now they're in help motion. So moving along from the text objects, those, those things are really useful. Um, a neat movement is to the next character. That's T and F. Uh, is, what? Yes. As Foster, our local expert, says, they're very useful. So if you want to go to the next instance of a character, like C or something, or M, then you can go to, you can type T M to get to that A, or F M to get to the and itself. You can combine that with a deletion or a change or something. So if you're at the beginning of the line and you want to delete through the M, you can type DFM or DTM or whatever. And then you can just easily get rid of a lot of the stuff you're using. Uh, the pipe is for moving to a specific column. You have to prepend it with a number to get where you're going. Um, G 
GJ and JK, I mean GK, are things you might want to uh, include when we talk about the bash or the MRC later, because you can remap them to um, the normal JK. And what those do is if you have something atrocious like this, then you can move the cursor um, between the wrapped lines. Normally with G and K, when you're moving up and down, it'll go to the next actual line. So this Vim thinks there are four lines here, but you can see there are many more. With GJ and GK, you can just skip to what the actual wrapped line. I think Robert has the map, right? No. Oh. <clears throat> the parentheses are moving are for moving between sentences, so those are not blocks, are not objects. Uh, you can see if you right. Stop using visual. Okay. <laughs> if you use it, if you just do a um, parentheses, then you'll move between sentences. Like it's denoted by a period, and I think maybe other period in white space. Oh, oh white space. Um, then the braces are paragraphs. Those are something I use all the time. A uh, paragraph is denoted by an empty line. So if you, this thing is an entire paragraph of argument. But if you were to insert a line between three, lines three and four, for example, then those would be, you can see he's moving between paragraphs right now. So that's pretty useful. You can delete a paragraph or just scroll, between, scroll down the whole list of stuff. It's pretty cool. If you're interested in finding out more about moving around really quickly, take a look at helpmotion.txt. Um, we're going to be seeing this command a lot. It's colon h and then the name of anything. Just colon h will take you to a page that explains how the help works and how to get more stuff. We took a lot of this documentation from the help documents. There's a lot of it though, so it's hard to just read. Now, Robert's going to talk a little bit about that anti pattern. Okay. So now that we know 50 bajillion different ways to get to any particular spot in the text, it's important that we try to do so efficiently. Have you ever found yourself while you're typing something in Vim hitting like L L L L L L L L L L L Well, yes, Robert. Keeping going to the end of a line or trying to get to a specific location? So if you find yourself doing that a lot, chances are what you're doing is an anti-pattern. There's another command in Vim that will help you do whatever you're trying to do better and faster. So, for example, if you're typing DDO to change the current line to something else, you can instead, instead just use S. So DDO or just Shift S. It does the same thing. Next, you could do DBX, so delete to the beginning of the word and then delete the current character versus DAW. Now, this is a slightly subtler variety of anti-pattern. Because, strictly speaking, yes, they do exactly the same thing, and they do it in exactly the same number of key presses. The catch here, though, is the second action is what's called repeatable, whereas the first one is not. So, let's talk about... Explain what that means. Yeah. Um, similarly, similarly, you could use find open brace, LVT, close curly brace, shift U, in order to do the same thing. What would that do, Robert? That would select everything inside of a tag, like an HTML tag. So we'll demonstrate here real quick. For some reason, we forgot to introduce what visual mode is. It's yes. really useful. It's a bunch of variations on the V key. And basically, you get what you see, you're seeing right here. You can select um, text using movements and stuff, and then do a bunch of cool things to that entire selected text. Okay. So that kind of gives you an idea of what a tag is. Uh, that said, though, you shouldn't be thinking for three minutes every time you want to type something, is there a more efficient way to do this? I mean, you could. It'd be fun. But you're not going to get very much done that way. So the big takeaway from this is, when you find yourself doing something and a lot, and you're thinking, oh gosh, there has to be a better way to do this, chances are you're right, and then it's time to find it. 
So let's talk about fixing some common annoyances. Um, in Vim, there is a file in your home directory called .vimrc. It contains common settings that you may have in your program, or in your, for Vim. So, for example. We'll talk about that plugin stuff in a while. Yeah. So here's an exam example of some stuff out of my vimrc. So I turn the mouse on. Um, Hitting escape is kind of a pain because it's all the way up on your left pinky. Robert's lazy. Yeah, I'm lazy. So I just remapped double tapping J in insert mode to escape. It makes it a lot easier to not have to hit escape as often. A lot of other people will also remap the control or the caps lock button on their keyboards to <laughs> an extra control key, which makes it easier to do the one of the other escape commands in them. So definitely a very useful thing to have. So that was only ninety three lines, it's so short. Yeah. His is like what, three hundred? Something like that. Yeah. Should be longer. Yeah. So another thing that you may want to do is by default Vim does not turn on syntax highlighting. Um, so it's very easy to fix that. You just in your VimRC add a line that says syntax on and then it'll start highlighting all your text and you'll be thinking where has this been all my life? Another thing you probably want to do is if you're like me and you use a dark background terminal, you probably want to set background equal to dark. That will change the color scheme just slightly so it's a little easier on the eyes on a black terminal. Um, in case you're wondering, there is also a set background equal light, but it's also the default, so you don't need to set it. So any questions about VimRC? There are bazillions of people's MRCs and bash RCs and a bunch of other RCs on GitHub directories, and GitHub repos, and websites, and all sorts of stuff. So it's very easy to find some great examples. Yeah. Um, Rusty had asked how I had this, like, the power line symbols on the text. It's actually a plugin called Airline. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the other thing that you're probably wondering when you first get into Vim is where did my copy-paste go? Um, this is kind of a weird thing to think about. So we're going to start off, just forget about copy-paste. It never really existed. So instead, you have a bunch of things called registers. So if you think about copy-paste, copy-paste has one register. So you can copy stuff into it or cut stuff into it and put it back out. Thankfully, this is not assembly registers, no assembly needed. Yeah, it's actually pretty easy to use. But in Vim, you actually have 35 of these things. So on the one hand, that explains why some of Vim's cut and paste commands are a little wonky. But on the other hand, you have a lot more power at your hands to do some pretty crazy stuff. So you also may be wondering, how do I paste something from the real world? So if you wanted to copy something, like say this, and you wanted to put it in Vim, you could do quote plus P. Quote and then the, a character means do something out of this register yeah. or do something to this register specifically. So the plus register, if you're using a Linux system running the XORB server, is the XORB global buffer. Sometimes it's uh, splat yeah. or an asterisk. <laughs> there is also a second global buffer called star, or splat as he's calling yeah. it. Sorry. Um, so if you're on a Windows machine, they equate to the same thing. If you're on a OS X or OS X machine, they equate to the same thing. If you're on a Linux machine, there is a little bit of subtlety between the XORG global buffer and the general global buffer. But generally speaking, that's an easy way to get stuff in and out of them. Now let's enumerate all the registers. Because you wanted to know that. Yes. Also, if you ever want to know what's in your registers, you can do colon reg and it'll show you all of your registers that currently contain text and what they contain. Or at least abbreviated. That was a really accidental macro. Okay. <laughs> 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 
Um, occasionally, you'll find you hit the Q button and it starts recording a macro. We'll talk about what those are. Yeah. But you can get some wonky stuff in your buffers as a result. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on here is, have you ever found yourself like typing something and then all of a sudden you want to paste something, but then you have to go out into normal mode, hit escape, and then quote, register, paste to paste the thing? That's really obnoxious. So in insert mode, you can actually do control R followed by a register name, and it will paste it as if you weren't actually in insert mode. You can also just do control R and then quotes and that'll paste the anonymous register, which is what you get when you just use Y or P. Yeah. So there's a lot of power here. And with the Control R command in insert mode, it saves you a ton of time in using it. The Intuitor has yanking and pasting, right? Yes, it just doesn't have Control R. No. Um, so let's talk about what some of these registers do. Yay. So one through nine are your delete registers. So anytime you delete something, like delete a line, it goes into one of these delete registers. You can kind of think of these as a queue. So every time you delete something, it pushes something onto the queue and pops the last thing off. So it gets added to one, and then it goes into two, so on and so forth. Um, if you've ever yanked something and then deleted a line in order to make space to put something, you may have been angry when you hit P and it didn't actually show up, because your yank appears to be clobbered. It actually didn't. So quote zero is the yank register. So whenever you yank something, that's the Y command, it puts it into the zero register. So this is a really useful thing. So if you're typing along, you delete a section, and you want to paste your stuff, you can do quote zero P or control zero or control R zero, and it'll put the contents of your previous yank. It's really useful and a great way to avoid the oops, I clobbered my yank problem. So the A through Z registers are very similar, but subtly different. So A through Z are the named registers. They're kind of general purpose. You have 26 of them. They're general purpose registers. Um, if you use the capitalized version of those registers, what that will do is it will, will append to where you previously typed stuff. So for example, if we wanted to add something to S, We can put this into S with quote capital S shift Y, and then we can do a quote SP, and you'll see that it had everything that I had previously plus the contents that I just yanked. So we'll go ahead and put that on a new line. What's just so it's a little bit. Shift Y is yank the whole line. Oh. Um, I've been using YY this entire time. Yeah. It's really useful. So. Just a small demonstration of that. Let's there, talk about more registers. Yes, there are a lot of registers. We're going to cover them very quickly. So if you ever searched for something and you want to paste that someplace, like for example, let's say you've used the star key to select the word that you're currently having the cursor on and search for different occurrences of it, and then you want to do a substitution or do something based off of what you've just searched for, you can use quote forward slash and it will paste the contents of your last search. So really handy when you start getting into what's called command mode. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Oh, we'll mention it. Yeah, we'll mention it in a little bit. So another thing to keep in mind is quote minus. So if you do something like a, a deletion that happens within a line. Like an X. Like an X or a DAW, it doesn't usually go into the one through nine registers. It actually goes into what's called the small delete register. It's just a quirk, something you should be aware of. So how many times have you been coding something and you needed to add something up really quick? Never. OK. Well, Austin's just weird. So if you find yourself needing to do some inline multiplication and you don't feel like multiplying 675 by 13, you can just do a control R equals, and then it will place the value of that mathematical result in line for you. Now, how advanced is that? What do you mean? So it will handle basic arithmetic operations. Um, it gets choked on floating points, though, so avoid floating point numbers. Marshall. Yes. Can it do other bases? Can it do other bases? Watch X or I don't know. I don't know. 
I would look in. I would do colon h. Um, yeah, take a look. Quote Form equals, or just try it. So, there's also some other things. Like, let's say, for example, you have a large section of text you just want gone. So, you'll find that if you start working with really large text sections and you're deleting them because it's putting them into those registers one through nine, it kind of starts, then starts to bog down a little bit because you have all of this memory allocated to storing this text. If you really want something just flat out gone, you can yank it into, or you can delete it into, quote, underscore, and then it's gone forever. Now you mentioned that Robert got cut off on delete slash cut, it yank, whatever. D the deletions are usually just actually a cut, and honestly, because honestly, they get saved. Yeah, with the exception of deleting to that specific yeah. register. So something to be aware of. You tired of registers yet? <laughs> so one last set of registers that we want to talk about. So quote colon is the last ex command. So if you ever find yourself needing to modify a previous ex command, you can either use control N or control P when you're on the command line, which is what you get when you hit colon, or you can just do control R colon and it will put the contents of your last ex command. If you ever want to paste the same text over and over again, you can use quote dot. If you want the name of the current file, you can do quote control R percent and it'll give you the absolute path of the file that you're working with. You may not think that that's super useful, but it's actually more it's more useful than you'd think. Also, there's something called yes, Rusty. Uh, so you keep saying you use control R, right? Yes. Now, doesn't that usually redo whatever you've done? That's only in normal mode. So if you're in insert mode, okay, it sense. gets the additional right. functionality of having that kind of. Yeah, I was like, Yes. So what happens if like I undo something and I actually want to go forward from the undo? How do I do that? So you've undone something and you want to go back to the next the thing that you undid yes. or okay. So in normal mode you will undo stuff. Mm -hmm. Control R will redo that Is undone that stuff. However, there's another feature we're not going to be covering today. Um, Vim actually keeps what's called undo and redo trees. So it actually keeps track of all of the different versions that you have. Isn't that great? What? Yes. You can also, uh, like, it's there are ways to go back to like five minutes ago and oh, yeah. like five minutes from now. What? Yes. Isn't that great? You yeah. Control I mean, if you went back already, yeah. what? Control O. It yeah. opens up everything that you've ever done, like the last, like, the it, last it'll cycle through the last open files. Yeah. Um, now, there is another thing I want to introduce. Can you go back to Vim and the file name you just pasted? If you're over a, um, a file name like this, I think then you can type gf and it'll open that file. So set a, like write, a, write the name of a different file, like bash rc or something. Okay. <coughs> now type gf. There you go. Oh my god. Isn't that great? Does yeah. that open it in a different buffer or? Yeah. Buffer. yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, you can actually, there's options that you can have it opened up in different places also, but by default it opens it in a new buffer. Vim has a lot of black magic. Yes. Even we don't know all of it. Um, Even Foster doesn't know all of it. He's pretty smart. Okay. So there's also something called an alternate file. That's generally speaking the last file that you edited. So if you're kind of going back and forth between two files and you need the name of the other file, it's in quote pound or quote Octothorpe if you're a typesetting nerd. So if you ever want to know more about registers, which... You're not tired of them. Yeah, colon H registers. All right, let's talk about macros. Finally, no more registers. <laughs> macros are, do that thing again that I just did, because it was cool. Now, there's a dot, which is a short macro operator for doing the same change that you just did. So for example, if you delete a word, and you want to keep deleting words, but you don't know how many words you want to delete. Then you can keep hitting dot, and it'll continue to activate the change you just made. It won't do movements, though. So if you type J and then delete a line, for example, then typing dot won't do the J again. It'll just do the line. So that's a really cool thing you can do if you want to just keep doing the same change or something. Now. 
that's not really advanced enough for if you want to do a complicated series of things to like every line or every other line or whatever. So in that case, you probably want to record a macro so that you can uh, have a history of a series of commands that you can replay over another series, over another line or something. So you start recording a macro by hitting Q and then the name of a letter, which actually records that series of commands into that letter's register. That's pretty cool, actually, because then you can paste out of that register and you can see the entirety of the command you were about to enter, so you can edit it and change around if you want to. So Robert's going to make an, do an example. Or did you already? I did already. Well, oh, you're I already made an example, so do it again because I didn't see it. Of recording a, um, you'll see this recording thing. I was there for a second. When you're recording, and once you finish recording, you hit Q to stop recording. Then when you want to replay a macro, you type the at symbol and then the name of the register that you want to play out. Mm -hmm. So Robert just did a couple and Robert wasn't watching. Macros are really cool. Um, if, like I said, you have a bunch of lines that you want to do something similar to, or you need to do something that can't be the exact same sequence of commands, like it involves some Thing about the text itself, you have to yank it and put it back, something like that. So those are really useful and pretty cool. Okay. That's it. Okay. So enough about macros. Let's talk about managing files. I was really confused when I started using Vim because it had these things called tabs that were not like tabs in Sublime Text or GEdit or anything. I was really confused. So there's a pretty straightforward system of editing multiple files in Vim. At the very bottom of the stack is buffers. A buffer is just a way to look into a text file. Um, those are buffers. I'll get more into those in a minute. On top of buffers, those are windows. Windows let you look at buffers. You've seen before that Robert has multiple um, panes up. Those are actually just windows. This is a window. That's a window. It brings up any more. Those are more windows. They're windows all of them. You can do all sorts of cool stuff with Windows, I'll talk about it in a minute. And at the top is tabs. Tabs, like I said, are not like the tab file browsing or like Chrome or whatever. They're actually just a container for a set of windows. That, in that way, I don't know if Robert can get anything up, but it's a way to switch between um, already defined setups for window layouts. So you might have like a a tree of files on one side, a list of important symbols, some scratch paper, I don't know, and then another tab you could have just the text. And that's pretty useful once you get the hang of it, but it takes a while because the commands are weird. So firstly, let's talk about, but more specifically, buffers. Can you go back? That no, no, back to the yes. There you go. Those commands at the bottom there, they're just for applying a set of uh, commands, well, a command over every buffer or tab or something. But more importantly, buffers. Like I said, they're just a window into a file. Uh, Vim like remembers every file you've opened unless you explicitly tell it to get rid of it. So you can take a look at all the buffers you have open with colon ls. That's, you'll get this list. Right now, Robert has a couple of nameless buffers that don't represent any file has that lorem awful thing, HTML page, is vimrc, those are everything he has open, and this is where he's at in them, editing them. Now that's, that's great, you say, how do I actually do anything with that? You can cycle between buffers with some pretty basic commands, colon bn will take you to the next buffer, colon bp will take you to the previous one. You can also switch quickly to the alternate um, file, which we mentioned a second ago, it's usually just the last file you edited with control caret. I actually hadn't found out about that until I was reviewing all the changes to this thing. Um, oh, right, of course. Now there's an, a neat command called uh, colon b, which is short for just colon buffers. Right after that, you can start typing out, uh, if, if you do a space, you can start typing out the name of a file you have open and it will fuzzily autocomplete it for you. So it's pretty smart if you know which file you want to go to. You can 
just type colon b space name of file. You can do tab completion too, so you don't have to type out the whole thing. That's pretty useful. Yeah, and if you ever want to be sure where it's actually going to take you, you can hit tab. If that's not the file that it wanted to take you to, but another file, you can continue to hit tab and it'll bring up all of the matches that match that particular fuzzy match. Okay, so onto Windows. It's not just an operating system anymore. Ugh. Windows are, as I said, fused into buffers. They're actually pretty simple to use, but they're complicated to master because there are a bazillion different commands for managing them, moving them around, all sorts of stuff. It's incredibly easy to get confused, as I have many times. But the most basic commands are going to be, for one, there's control W is the prefix for pretty much every uh, keyboard-based window command. Most of them have a uh, colon command-based uh, brother, but generally you can do everything with control W and then some. My favorite is Control WC, which will close whatever window you're in right now. That's really helpful if, for example, you're trying to do the help and it brings up another extra window somewhere and you can't figure out how to escape. If you hit uh, Control W and then W again, you'll cycle through windows, to, so moving between them. Um, you can also use Control W and then a directional key to go in that direction. You can do Control W N to make a new empty window that has an empty buffer inside of it. <clears throat> you can do Control W S to hor horizontally split, no, vertically split. No. Horizontally split. Horizon yes, horizontally split a window so that you're looking into the same file again. It's not a copy of the same file, it's actually the same. So you can look at the top and the bottom of the file at the same time, for example. And Control W and V splits it vertically. These things are all listed in the slides, so, and in the help. Uh, I think that's it for Windows, isn't it? Yes. Windows are probably the most important thing to try and get used to, aside from buffers. Tabs, I almost never use because I never get that in depth into having to specifically out things. But it's still useful to know what they are. They're a way to hold a, bunch, a collection of windows. You can go to the next and the previous with G, T, and capital T, respectively. And that's pretty much it. You make a new one with colon tab new, and to rearrange everything to your liking, like go to previous tabs and so on. They keep themselves pretty separate from each other. Now, Robert will mention some syntax completion and programming apps. Okay, so let's say you have some C file that you want to edit. And you find yourself typing something and you're like, oh, I want to make some change to num to guess. So you can start typing num, but typing that takes a long time. So you can just hit control N and it'll auto complete to the end of the line. If there's multiple options, it will let you alternate between the options. You can go up and down through the different auto-completion options with control N and control P. So that's simple completions. Um, however, there's also what's called omni-completion. So if you're using one of the languages that support it, you can use omni-completion. So if you're typing something in C, you can do control X. Yeah. It will do different things based off what your syntax completion is set up to do. It has very different behaviors depending on what specific language you're using, and it's actually kind of a pain to set up, but once it's set up, it works like a charm. Vim will learn how to autocomplete anything that it has syntax highlighting for, so you can start using different syntax completions for that. Some other different completions that you should probably know. Control insert mode, by the way. Yes. Would be control X, control F for file names. So, so then we can cycle through all of the files in this particular directory. If we want, say, um, definitions of words. So for example, let's say we're putting in a comment and we're trying to remember how to spell explore. 
because we're having a really bad day, we've been typing. We can actually cycle through all of the words in Vim's dictionary until we find the specific one that we're looking for. You can also do Control X again to have it go back and try a different type of matching. So, another thing we probably want to mention would be tags. So, how many people know what C tags is? Okay, one person. We will go over C tags later in the presentation, so I'll cover that more in a minute. Um, keywords. So, keywords are anything that Vim will syntax highlight by default, so you can take advantage of that in order to syntax complete stuff. Um, control X, Control L is for completing lines. You wouldn't think this is too terribly useful, but if you're writing markdown and you don't like using pound signs to indicate headers, it's actually really easy to use line completion to put in those headers that you want. So if you could do stuff, this is a test, more stuff, foo bar, and then we want to put in a new heading too. We can do control X, control L. Yep. We can type two of these, control X, control L, and it'll autocomplete to the matching line. So it's not useful in every language, but if you have a specific line that you're trying to copy, it could be very useful. Like everything else in the syntax completion, it will do fuzzy matching, so pretty useful to have in your toolbox. Um, some other completions to know about are thesaurus completion. This is another one of those ones that you have to set up in order to use it. You have to give them a thesaurus file. Um, Project Gutenberg publishes a good one <coughs> that's in the correct format that you need, so just grab the thesaurus from there. Um, dictionaries will pull it out of Vim's spelling. Um, control X, Control S will cycle, so if you have something that's incorrectly spelled and you want to correct the spelling, Control X, Control S will go through the different spelling suggestions for you, which is really nice without having to go into Vim's spelling change mode. Um, yes, Vim does do spelling correction if you didn't know that. So, like, we can show you that at the end of the presentation. Lastly, you can use Control X, Control V for Vim commands. So, if you're editing your Vim RC, you can use Control X, Control V to complete different Vim commands. Or, if you're in command mode and you're trying to complete a bunch of different Vim commands, you can use Control X, Control V to also do that. Okay, now let's pretend that you're going to get a job, fancy that, and you need to write up a letter including the word resume, and if you're weird like me, you want to include the E with a little uh, accent on it. That's where digraphs are useful. Gone are the days of alt codes, where you have to type in alt something or other, or go to Google and copy the whole the actual word. Instead, you can, if you're in insert mode, type control K, and then a combination of two letters to get what's called a digraph. It will automatically turn into a whole letter that actually is something you can't normally type. So as an example, if, you're, if you need that E, you can hit, in insert mode, control K, E and then the accent character, which would probably be a, a forward apostrophe, something like that. And there you go. Say what? Yeah, it's a back tick. Apostrophe right. Sorry. Yeah. It's the other one. Yes. But the right symbol is what you're looking for. You can get a whole lot of symbols like this. Um, I, I in the. In the presentation, I put the omega character. You can get all sorts of stuff. There's a huge list in health digraphs. So if you ever need to, uh, if you ever need to put in a special character, that's that's the way to go. And of course, digraphs can really insert, for example, a literal tab character if you need one. Um, in that case, you can, from insert mode, type Control V, and then whatever character, whatever key you hit next, will be inserted literally. I use it all the time, put in tabs. You can also do, I think, backspace or line breaks, whatever you need. So if you need to put in special characters, you just have to cover. You're going to paste that job here. 
So I'm going to very briefly mention a concept called templates and a concept called abbreviations. For me personally, this has been replaced by another feature that Austin's going to talk about in a few minutes. But if you're one of those people who doesn't want to have a ton of plugins in your particular programming setup, let's say you're in a contest environment where you can't necessarily download your plugins for your text editor, this is a good thing to know about. So from the command line in Vim, you can say colon r and it will read in a file. So what you can do is if you're editing, for example, a C file and there's a standard template of stuff that you want to load into the file, you can do zero, so at, before the first line, read in the path to the template. And that will put the entire contents of that file whenever you start a new document. So as I said, if you're in a contest environment or something like that where you need to basically set up a template and have it consistent on each file that you're using, it can be very useful. Um, another trick that you can do is block this on something called auto commands. We're not going to be covering those today, but something to look up if you want to make this specialized for file types or something of that sort. Um, we're also going to talk about how to do some quick snippets. So you can do colon AB, which will let you view your current list of abbreviations. So I don't have any abbreviations, but you can do colon AB stuff. and it will actually do abbreviations like stuff. If you are like me though, you want a little bit more power in this. So if you're using a plugin that I would re recommend called UltiSnips, um, and you want to insert, I don't know, like a main function in C, you can type M-A-I-N tab and it will go ahead and autocomplete all of that for you. It's a useful little feature to have. So any questions about snippets? Um, a lot of the use that people use it for is let's say you misspell a certain word a lot. You can use abbreviations to just kind of like the autocorrect feature in Word to just fix it as you're typing so you don't have to go back and correct that specific word. All right, so Robert mentioned that there's a plugin that he uses. What are plugins? They're a whole lot like the plugins and stuff you can get for other text editors like TextMate and Sublime Text. But in Vim's case, well, also in Vim's case, you can get these things, magical things that are called plugins made by other people in the Vim community to add extra functionality and new cool stuff like better commands into Vim that it didn't previously have. Uh, there is a plugin called a Bundle that will manage your plugins for you. It's kind of meta and weird. This is a list of all of Robert's installed plugins. And a nice thing about the plugin Bundle is that it looks at this list and checks to see if anything needs updating or installing or changing or whatever. And it handles all of that for them. Um, it has very good documentation, so if you're interested, if you're getting into plugins, then I definitely recommend you check it out. We'll have links to it in this. Plugins live in your .vim folder in your home directory. Um, now, a lot of times if you're dealing with plugins, then you'll see this thing in key commands called the leader. And that takes a while to figure out. What the leader key is, is a user set key that you can prepend to a lot of, to whatever key commands you want it to, so that it'll, it won't overwrite any pre-existing commands. That way you can set up your own commands that are based on plugin actions and stuff. Um, I've, I set my leader key to be space, some people like comma. It's a pretty, weird thing, but once you get into plugins, you'll be used to it, I'm sure. The other thing is, by default, it's backslash. Right. Not two backslashes, as the presentation has. <coughs> there are tons of plugins. I have about 20 installed. I have too many. Here are some really useful ones. We'll have a link to a website that has even more. Nerd Tree is a tree-style um, file list, kind of like it's blind text or text made looks like that. It's pretty powerful. Syntastic is for syntax checking and things that can be syntax checked like Python. It's kind of like an automatic linter if you've used those before. If Robert breaks something, hopefully it'll show him that he's doing something silly. Yeah, like that.
So apparently my C syntax checking is broken oh, right now. This isn't working. It happens a lot too when things don't work. Fugitive, Git interaction. If you got that job because you're cool and smart and you need to do version control, then uh, Fugitive has got your back. It's a really cool wrapper for Vim for doing Git stuff. Robert and I both like it. You can automatically, well not automatically, but you can add stuff and commit things and do whatever that was. I'm scared. Surround is another one of my favorites. It'll allow you to edit surrounding characters. So for example, if you have a thing in quotes and you want to change those quotes to single quotes or backticks, then you can very easily just change it with a uh, single or a couple char key, key characters. So change those to something else, like parents. Okay, I'm forgetting the prefix for surround. It's uh, C, S, and then quotes, and then uh, right parent. There we go. There you go. So, with only 30 seconds of confusion, he was able to change those quotes <laughs> into parentheses. Once you get used to it, it goes a lot faster. Yeah, I don't use surround as often as he does. It's really helpful if you're editing HTML. If you're not doing a ton of HTML, it has different usability. I really like it. It makes me feel cool. So, Moving on, there's Alti Snips and Vim Snippets. Alti Snips is a snippet engine. Robert just introduced it because it's really useful. Snippet, Vim Snippets is a collection of default snippets that adds a lot of really useful things for most programming languages. Tim Pope is a major contributor to um, the Vim scripting community. Yeah, and pretty much Vim in general. He made Fugitive and Surround and a bunch more. Anything he makes is going to be pretty useful. Now, Robert's going to go back to code base management. Okay. So C tags is a program. It's been around forever. But what it does is it essentially scans your code for certain attributes, like variables, function names. If you're in a programming, object-oriented programming language, it will scan it for class names, things of that sort. And it will record these things in what's called a tags file. So what C tags will let you do is if you have a particular Vim or a particular set of code that you're editing in Vim and you want to see where stuff went, let's go over to our foobar example. You can actually keep track of a list of functions and stuff in it. I'm using a plugin right here to kind of show this off. So you but essentially it'll keep track of all of the different functions you have. And then as you add additional functions, now normally this window doesn't take up take up half of your working space. It's yeah. Side somewhere, so it actually is useful. And then we could go out of them for just a moment. And then we can do a C tag of foobar.c. And we can resume. And if we look, it'll add foo to our list. Um, once you have the tags file created, Vim will edit the tags file as you're editing your program and will start actually keeping track of the changes and stuff that you make to these tags. It's really useful. Um, keep in mind, you will need to, if you create new files in the directory, you will need to add those to the tags directory. You can use bash globbing in order to do all of that. Um, if I had thought for more than a few seconds about how to do that, I could have also done colon bang c tags star dot c, and that would write, run the command and then pop me right back into them after I'm done. Using a colon bang, the exclamation point can will allow you to just run any shell command from inside of it. It'll give you the output in that nice little window, and it's pretty convenient to not to you can also do things like filter so if you want to do like percent bang awk and run an awk script on your vim code you could do something hideous like that but it's completely an option so just kind of keep in mind filtering and then kind of the shell escape as two easy things to do there um, if you have 
let's call foo right here yes so you can use control close square bracket and it'll actually jump you to the definition of the function so let's say this is in a much less convenient place like this and we want to jump back to it we can use control close square bracket and it will take us to the definition of that which function bracket was that? Control well, close square bracket close. Uh, the really awesome thing is if you have your path set up properly and you have C tags set up properly, the control tag or clo control close square bracket will actually take you to whatever file that function happens to belong to. So if you're like debugging a ray tracer, which has 50 bajillion functions in seven or eight different files, and you have no idea where that function is defined, control square bracket will save you a lot of time in finding it. Um, once you've jumped over to that function you need to jump back, it's just control T, and it'll take you back to wherever you jumped from. So if you want to think of it like a programming stack, it works a lot the same way. There's also another program called Cscope. Um, Cscope is very, very powerful, but it's also has two limitations. One, it's exclusively for C or C++. It does not support any other languages. And the person who maintains it has no intention of making it support other languages. But the other thing is, because it's a little more syntax heavy, it's really only useful for really large code bases. But for example, this summer I, had a, I worked at a job where we had we had programs where we had several million lines of C code. And if you want to find a specific function, C scope will actually find that function for you, give you the parameters for it. It will let you do global find and replace. So if you're used to Eclipse and you have that, you like that nice little refactor thing, C scope will actually do that for C and C++ code. So if you ever find yourself editing large C applications, Cscope is invaluable for that. <coughs> Any questions about C tags or Cscope? Um, one other thing I wanted to cover really quickly is using Vim to test faster. So if you find yourself writing a bunch of code, there's my syntactic check, by the way. Uh -huh. So it finally showed up. So if you find yourself editing a bunch of Vim code, or C code, and, or pretty much any other programming language, and you want to start testing it, you can do colon make, and it'll actually execute your make file. So I'll show you the make file in a second, but you also notice that it came up with a little error right there. So you'll notice, let's go to the top of the file, and do make again. That's GG, by the way, the top of the file. You'll notice that I'm back down at where the error was. So by default, whenever you execute make as colon make, it will take you to whatever line that particular error was. If you had the first error. Yes. And you can use colon C open, and it'll actually give you an explanation of what changes need to be made and where. If you have a bunch of problems with your code, So if we have three errors generated, you can do, I believe it's close bracket C. No. What did I say it was? Bracket C will take you back and forth from the errors in your C file. So you can easily jump through and fix these different problems. So if we fix this, add our semicolon, do make, write, make, and it compiles our code for us. And then if we want to test, we can do colon, bang, and then you can do, in this case, dot slash foobar. And this is a guessing game. So there we go. And you can test your stuff from within them. So I said I was going to show you that make file, so I'll go ahead and show you the make file. Pretty simple. Um, if I was thinking about this a little bit more, I probably would have thrown a make test in there. That way I could have just done make test and it would have allowed me. Actually, let's go ahead and do that. 
and have test depend on foobar. Five. Okay. So obviously I had a slight problem there. Don't worry about it. But essentially that's the idea. Um, so some other commands that I showed off. Uh, CN will take you to the next problem that you had. CW will bring up the list of errors that exist. Um, C open will open the window in what's called the quick fix window. So it's an easy way to look and see what changes you need to make to your code in order to get it to compile. And lastly, if you don't want to remember control Z as a quick way to get out of them and then pop right back into it, you can also do colon shell, do your shell commands in your shell and then pop right back. So we are back to our shell. When we exit, we end up back in them. So any questions there? All right. So these are a bunch of commands that we just thought are cool, and we didn't have another place to really put them. Some of my favorites are GQ and then a motion to word wrap that line or that paragraph or whatever you want so that it'll fit within the 80 character or 90 character, what have you, boundary, useful, useful for Python, for example. V and capital V and control V are both for visual mode stuff. Um, we saw that, we explained it briefly before. It's for editing weirdly shaped bunches of text. It's pretty useful. Check out um, help visual mode so we can learn more about it. The colon enters the command line. There's a whole bunch of powerful stuff that you can do that we didn't cover hardly at all. So you can do help colon there. And one thing that I just remembered, if you're in normal mode, you can use control X and control A to decrement and increment the numbers that your characters are on. So you should see an example. That's horrifying. There we go. So once he finds a number, Use the four definition, right? So control A goes up and control X goes back down. It's automatic, like if you have a hundred, it'll go 101, 102, and it'll go back down to 99. You won't just do the single one with the cursor. It's pretty smart. Uh, it doesn't work for dates. There's a plugin for it though. Alright, and that actually just about wraps up what we have planned. That was a lot of material, and I think I'm exhausted as you guys are. We'll put this presentation out in an email so you can see anything you might have missed. We actually recorded it at this time. Yes. yes. Uh, these links are all very useful, especially, well, no. I'll explain Especially them. all of them. <laughs> if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Come talk to us. Uh, we'll be, like I said, sending this out to the mailing list. If you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to be, also come talk to us. We'd like to talk to you go briefly through this list of resources that we have here. So you'll see two resources by Drew Neal, one of which is Practical Vim. That's a book, comes on dead trees. It also comes in an electronic format. It is an excellent book. It's a collection of about 40 Vim tips that change the way that you think about Vim and how to do stuff in Vim, and it can be really efficient. I actually found it a quite interesting read. I read it over Christmas. Um, Vim Casts is basically a video summary of a lot of the tips that he has in his book, but there are also tips that are not in his book and tips that are in the book that are not in the Vim Casts. So if you're more of a visual person, you want to see it done, this is a great place to look. Um, if you ever search how to do some random thing in Vim, you'll probably see the Vim Tips Wiki show up. Um, it's very useful. Another place you can look for that kind of information is Stack Overflow. Um, we mentioned Vundle. I use it. I cannot recommend it highly enough. And then Austin also recommends something called Vim Awesome. So you want to speak on that? Vim Awesome is just a website that catalogs a ton of different plugins. That's all there is to say about it, actually. So, thank you for your time. Uh, any closing questions? Once, twice. <laughs>